And now and this is running three times faster than it is just so we can easily see it. Um, but they successfully defend the trap this time. Um, they will lose. <laughs> um, the trigger fish will hang out in these traps. Um, they know it's a free meal. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it'll kill every lobster in it to eat one of their tails in peace. Pardon? How long did it take them to kill all three? Um, uh, just minutes. So uh, uh, they're, they're good predators. Um, and here's a shot at night. So this is an infrared light, shows up as black and white. And uh, um, there's the stone crab. This is a little tiny stone crab. Stone crab are not normally predators on lobsters. And in fact, if that stone crab was any smaller, the lobsters would eat it. Um, but in this case, <laughs> it can break off their toes. Um, it's very easy to recognize lobsters that have been in traps because their dactyls are missing. Sometimes that's when the traps pulled over the edge of the boat. The other time, it's when things like stone crabs bite their toes. <laughs> um, another shot. Um, you just saw it swim by the outside. Oh, um, oh my God. So, Traps are 32 inches long. He's 36 inches long. <laughs> um, you find them when you pull traps, you find one nurse shark in about 100 trap poles. Um, he is just wreaking havoc. Um, he is a major predator on small lobsters. Um, uh, uh, and so this, he was in the trap for about five minutes. Um, this, you're about to see a behavior right here. He is backing up, raising his head. He knows exactly where the throat is. And uh, in less than five minutes, he came in and got out. I never, ever thought that would happen. <laughs> um, now, look at all the fish, and they're gone. <laughs> uh, a cormorant. Uh, uh, and there went, I don't know if y'all saw that. That was a fish being eaten. Um, so this is the plastic throat. The people in Key West and the lower keys have a slat throat. Um, in very shallow water, traps actually kill a lot of cormorants. Um, their head, not with that plastic coat. This is the trap being pulled out of the water and how we end. And I've got a couple more of these, but that was sort of the first video we made of the traps. Um, so this was episode one, just fun stuff happening in traps. We've got another one that shows the predation, and then we've got one showing the escape. So this is science for us. What we're actually doing is calculating how lobsters die, how they escape, and what's the turnover in the trap? This information we can visually take right to the fishermen and sort of show them what those numbers are. Based on this research, um, we think we can save about half a million of those million lobsters. We're now trying to figure out, teach the fishermen, when you pick this lobster up, how do you know it's weak? So those are the next experiments we've done. And actually, starting this August, we'll be taking that onto a couple of the boats in the Keys. Why the fishermen care? A healthy lobster attracts three times more catch than another one. An unhealthy lobster actually doesn't do anything. It's neutral. But if it dies, it's negative, and another lobster won't go in that trap. So that by watching dolphin go by turns out solution holes those karst holes in the lime zone uh lauren back there who works with us um saw she says 100 lobsters that were legal size um we'll see if our math is <laughs> um uh but those are oases um there's so much biomass in those then there's all sorts of predators coming by checking out those holes to forage on a regular basis just like lions going to a watering hole in other environments uh, Florida's most valuable fishery. Um, I'm not counting things recreationally like red snapper. When a person's willing to pet buy a million dollar boat to go catch a red snapper, that just doesn't count. <laughs> but commercially, when we're selling stuff, um, we land about 6 million pounds of lobsters a year. Right now, they run about $8 each. That puts us at about $48 million for the fishery. Um, uh, uh, the most valuable fishery. Stone crab is arguably a little bit more when the price is good. Unfortunately, the catch of stone crabs down from 3 million pounds to 2 million pounds because of bad fishing practices. So lobster is clearly in the lead right now. Popular recreational fishery. We're about, we have sold 
I think, 300,000 recreational lobster licenses. Um, turns out only 150 of those are pro thousand are probably used. We give away a lot of licenses now with free licenses. Um, it's a great way to make money, <laughs> but it's really hard to do math on people who buy a license or get one free. Um, if, for example, I'm a lifetime fisherman, I bought that lifetime license, it comes with a free lobster stamp. Uh, I do actually do lobster, but I don't snook. It comes snook fish, but it uh, comes with that snook mass. That is not just a revenue making thing, which is what our people in Tallahassee look at, it's science. That is a list of people who come down here who want to catch lobsters, who I can now communicate with why they want to catch them, what they catch. And so it's incredibly important for us to have a licensed database like that because it allows us to communicate with our clients who want these lobsters and get data from them. We're, of course, in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The sanctuary does not touch pre-existing fishing, fishing regulations. So, um, so a lot of people hated the sanctuary. We're going to do away with commercial fishing. They can't. It is just not in their charter. So that is not even on the table to discuss, except closed areas. Um, so far, the sanctuary has closed approximately 2% of the area they manage. Pretty small numbers. Um, but this is in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuaries. Their mandate is to protect the natural resources and the ecological function of the Keys. We catch probably 90% of the lobsters every year that are legal size. Those lobsters no longer have a normal ecological function in the Florida Keys. What are we supposed to do about that? I don't have an answer. We just have that question out there. Um, mortality used as bait. I've casually mentioned about a million lobsters die used as bait. Every year we lose about 100,000 lobster traps. How? Any thoughts? How in the world can we lose 17%? The buoys are cut. The buoys are cut by recreational boaters. We've Hurricane. done Hurricane. hurricanes. I'm not even counting. <laughs> Certainly after Irma, we probably lost 300,000. But this is just recreational boat traffic cutting off buoys. They are hard to avoid. Um, it's, it's a 50 foot rope in 12 feet of water. They need the 50 feet to actually pull it at the rate they're going. Um, I would say it's a problem. Let's not say stupid. <laughs> Uh, dynamic rope. Um, I spend a lot of time studying rope and buoys and stuff like that. Um, the rope they use, that black polypropylene, is the cheapest rope in the market. If you pull it through a trap puller and squeeze the water out of it, it floats for three days. If you leave it in the water for too long, which is just three days, it sinks because it gets saturated with water. Even though it doesn't absorb water, just the water gets into it so I call that a dynamic rope. It's neither a sinking rope nor a floating rope. It depends on what happened to it a few minutes ago. It is really, really hard to manage. Um, whale entanglement, something that's going on in the American lobster fishery. Um, uh, uh, Maine lobster, as most people know it. Um, uh, because of climate change, the lobstering grounds are moving farther and farther north. They're now, the whales have moved into those grounds because they're eating, I'm sorry, the whales are moving further north where they've always lobster fished. 10 years ago, they didn't interact with ropes. Now they do because of the water temperature change and the whales are following their food and they're tangling in Canadian lobster ropes. They've got lots of regulations on the size of the rope, the floating, the sinking, vertical versus horizontal. And they're very much trying to manage protecting the right whales that are, of course, breeding down here during the uh, winters. Uh, Ghost traps, those are those 100,000 traps. Um, basically, the trap continues to function just like the lobster fishermen put it out there. A trap catches about 10 lobsters a year. When it's lost, a new trap will continue to fish for a year, catching about 10 lobsters. Um, so that's another half million lobsters that died due to those cutoffs. Um, trap fishery habitat. Um, turns out when you drop a lobster trap, it literally lands like a feather. Even though it weighs 74 pounds, in the water, it has very little buoyancy, and it, I'm sorry, very little weight, so it lands very softly. When that lap trap settles and is pulled again, it does about this much damage. I thought this was really good research when I did it, and then it dawned on me, there's been a fishery here for 100 years. <laughs> One of my control sites, anytime we measure the damage where a trap is, I'd always go five meters away and measure the damage where the trap wasn't. After visiting that control site three times over the course of the recovery, I realized there was a square edge. 
there was a trap slab that had been overgrown by coral. So my control site is a place a trap was setting probably 20 years ago. I was studying the current impacts on an already damaged reef. Y'all dove in the Caribbean, I suspect, plate forming corals. When's the last time you saw a plate forming coral in the Florida Keys? Same species, but that growth, growth morphology doesn't exist here anymore because it's fragile and it can't resist traps. The National Marine Fisheries Service hired me to study the impacts of 50 traps. December crawled around. I was on trap 46. We were very excited. This project was about to end. The wind blew. Some of my marked traps moved 50 meters in a 30 knot wind. Turns out winds that move traps occur 18 times a year during the fishing season. Two of those times are tropical disturbances. This is a normal event that traps move. They basically move until they hit something underwater. What are they going to hit? The reef. <laughs> um, so if you're looking for trap debris, look which way. Basically, the wind blows from the east around here. Go to the west, go to the, I'm sorry, uh, the east side of the corals, because that's where the trap debris piles up. So it's pretty easy, actually, to find trap debris because it piles up. Turns out mobile gear, just like a shrimp net or something, is when the real damage occurs. Um, uh, traps move anytime the wind blows for three days over 20 knots. That's every week in the winter. So this is a normal thing. The fishermen don't consider that trap movement because the traps have only moved 10 meters or so, well within the range of where they put them. There was 50 foot ropes. Um, you add a, to fish a trap, you take the water depth. If it's in 50 feet, that's 50 feet of rope. Add another 30 feet, so you want 80 feet of rope on it. Um, 100,000 traps with that average 50 to 75 feet of rope. Can somebody do the quick math on how many miles of rope that is lost every year? 1,000 on the 50 foot rope. So that's how much rope is lost in the Florida Keys every year. This rope, it's not great, of course. It's not fishing line. It's not absolutely lethal to everything it touches, but it's certainly a visual problem. I have a hard time diving in the Keys anymore and not seeing marine debris. I can see lobsters from a half mile away. I can see marine debris, rope, and stuff about that same distance. So diving isn't nearly as fun for me as it used to be. Protected species, loggerhead turtles. Loggerhead turtles think they love lobsters. <laughs> I don't think they're actually very good at getting them out of traps. They also eat the gooseneck barnacles off of buoys. The fishermen up in this region, you'll often see a normal wooden trap wrapped in wire. The only reason they do that is to stop turtles from breaking the traps. Um, I'm pretty sure a lobster swims up to a trap, breaks out one corner of it, the lobsters move to the far side, it swims around to the far side, breaks that corner out, and all the lobsters leave the hole it just made. They will break 10 or 20 traps in a row. And I'm pretty sure they don't get a single lobster out of it. Um, one of the bizarre things... <laughs> Um, that's another story. I actually, teamwork among turtles is actually a real thing. Um, uh, um, so I'm a biologist. You swim around the ocean. I look for poop. <laughs> turtles have very distinctive poop. Green turtles, it's green. It's full of grasses broke down and stuff. Loggerheads have pretty um, distinctive poop also. Think about eating corn. <laughs> but they're eating lobsters. I have never seen Panularis argus shell in the poop. I always see slipper lobster poo in, in it. Um, I think they're quite selective. Slipper lobsters can't move nearly as quickly, and I think they are a major element of lobster food on the reef. At the end of this talk, I'll show you some of those pictures, and I am way off topic. <laughs> um, uh, protected species, mostly it's uh, the loggerhead turtle, um, dolphin. Turns out, Florida Bay here has a uh, Terceops truncatus, the bottlenose dolphin. There's about 300 of them in a subgroup. Um, they tangle in ropes also. Much more commonly, manatees and things tangle in blue crab traps, but that is a major concern for the fishery. If more than 1% of the population, which is three entanglements occur, the fishery is shut down. A few years ago, we had two. Um, and we stepped in and did some research, and uh, we haven't had another entanglement yet. So it's not, dolphin aren't a major impact, but uh, certainly something that's watched very carefully. Trap debris, I mentioned that 1,000 miles of rope, those 100,000 traps. 
the next couple of things, lobster ecology. This is what we would love to work on and everybody I hire wants to work on. Um, I mentioned we take about 90% of the population, but lobsters are really cool. Um, solution holes, things like red grouper actually dig holes and make those solution holes. What is the effect when we remove 50% of the lobster biomass in 30 days? Those solution holes silt in and other things. Uh, and so we just, are start just learning about the ecology of the lobster and how important they are for the dynamics of things like that. Um, lobster behavior is just really cool. Um, lobsters, they're nocturnal, they have these big eyes, but everything in their life is chemical and sound. Um, and so that is the biggest thing to learn about lobsters. Um, the fishermen are, oh, we want a dark trap to catch the lobsters. No, it's at night. They're not seeing any of that. <laughs> but it is all about the chemicals. And we'll go into that chemical attraction. We'll go into sex with lobsters uh, between themselves, not us. And um, uh, it is all about the chemistry. Um, uh, a little bit on the fishery. Um, typical lobster boat. Um, Bay anymore, we have a 45, 52-foot boat. Um, we are down to 369 boats. Just 20 years ago, we had 1,400. That's actually a good thing. We had way too many fishermen. Uh, how that happened is we're reducing the amount of gear. We've made every lobster fisherman in the Keys a 0.6 millionaire. We gave away permission to use traps. We gave away 750,000. We're down to 450,000. They're valued at $200 each. A typical fisherman has 2,500. So that's half a million bucks that we essentially created out of thin air. So when they're old, their boat's broken, their back's broken, because it is really a hard job. They've got a half million dollar retirement plan when they sell their boat and they're or really when they sell nothing, just the permission to fish their gear. Um, they like it. <laughs> um, what we've actually done is consolidated the fishery down to a handful of people. The guys left are making more money than they've ever made before because we basically got rid of a thousand people. The guys who got out weren't very good fishermen. The guys who are left are the cream of the crop. They are out catch their brethren uh, two to one. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of skill to this. I sort of joke there's a couple of people up here. One of them, uh, two of the best fishermen in the industry are in this part of the world. Um, I, I sort of do the joke, I wouldn't let them do my taxes. But um, one of the fishermen we worked with, um, the first time I did this as a really arrogant 28-year-old biologist fresh out of school, <laughs> released them, fished 100 traps. I'm sitting here with my computer counting, you missed one. He sort of looks around. He's not really looking because it's underwater. And he goes, nope, we got them all. 36. Sorry, misnumbered that one. <laughs> he knew where those 100 items were he randomly dropped in the ocean. He wasn't using a GPS. He just knew where the traps were. I can't remember 100 things in my refrigerator, let alone 100 things randomly placed in the ocean. He was showing off. He put 100 traps in his best fishing holes. But that the man has a hundred or more best fishing holes to drop a trap is just an incredible knowledge base. So yeah, dumb fishermen, it just doesn't work anymore. These guys know what they're doing. They're mechanics. They have this massive knowledge of what they're doing and the best ones know everything about their fishery. Bully netting. This is both the commercial and recreational activity. Largely uh, became popular because we didn't allow diving at night. So they started doing this. There's about 300 commercial bully netters about 100 do it for one year, <laughs> about another 100 do it for two years, and the other 100 basically have been in it 10 or more years. Um, it is a small fishery. They are highly hated because they show up in your backyard with live music. Live music. The loud music guys are probably recreational ones, not commercial ones, um, but they are generally a highly hated group. The commercial trappers think they're robbing their gear at night. Some of them, <laughs> again, there's one kid in the lower keys who's actually 30 now, I'm calling a 30-year-old a kid, um, that can do this in 20 feet of water. Dear God, I have no idea what he can see. Um, but he's incredible. Catches 100 pounds a night, legitimately does it. And um, that's a decent daily salary at eight bucks a lobster. Is there about a pound each? Um, but most of the guys are catching like 30. It's a little paycheck at night and keeps you from watching too much Netflix. Here's the catch. The biggest part of the pie is trap fishery. There's that one and a half million recreational, that trap discard mortality. The 100 baits, the half million is in uh, ghost fishing is the same size as the recreational community. 
this is what I'm trying to fix as a lobster biologist. Bully netters, commercial dive, or these little slivers down here. If y'all remember back in like 2009, casitas, is that a word anyone remembers? Yeah. Little house in Spanish. Um, fisheries in the Bahamas is almost entirely casitas. Um, uh, in the Bahamas, in their constitution, it's a legal right to fish and harvest, um, and anyone can go out and do this. Um, and so there's casitas, basically garbage dumped all over the bottom of the ocean. They move in storms. Um, some of our fish, this was never allowed, certainly wasn't allowed in the sanctuary. Um, but that basically, in the 2009-ish area, um, these guys peaked at about a million pounds. Right now, they're at about 150,000 to 300,000 pounds. Um, and that's just divers on natural habitat. We don't think there's that many casitas out there now. There's some. Um, uh, certainly when we counted these, we had side scan sonar in different areas. We counted about 5,000. Um, those 5,000 landed a million pounds of lobsters. It's a dang efficient gear. Traps only catch about 10 pounds each. Um, ghost trap. Zooming in, going underwater. There's that rope. You can see where it's sort of frayed at the end. It caught a buoy. Um, this was in July, right before the season opened. Um, opening up this trap. Here's our lobsters inside. Broken antenna again, probably from a trigger fish. Um, these lobsters are all looking pretty healthy. Um, good coloration, little grunts swimming around with them. Uh, here's a second trap. Um, Mithrax, the Caribbean king crab in there. Um, uh, uh, very active. Um, and that's that other half million, 100,000 traps, half million lobsters dying in those. Uh, was a lot of research we did. Did you let them go? Uh, yes. So as a state employee, we can bust gear out and say, well, I can bust gear during the season. As, as long as it is missing, as long as it's not a legal trap, doesn't have a buoy, doesn't have a tag, that's fair game for Lauren and I to take out. Um, during, you can never do it, except we've actually gotten the law. You can create an organization. It can be you and your dog. <laughs> and we will give you a permit to take out those traps. Can we break them? Absolutely. Uh, during the closed season, so after March, all the traps in the water belong to the state of Florida. So they are not private property anymore. And as part of the rule, we can make you a, a give you a permit from the state of Florida to, uh, to pick up traps. Now, when I touch a trap, it's mine. <laughs> I can't dump it because now I'm in the sanctuary waters. Um, so, uh, uh, concrete. We figure we have lost a million concrete slabs in Florida Bay. I can't find them. They sunk in the sediment. They got incorporated into the reef. So in some habitats, those the wood totally rots. The rope, of course, persists forever. The buoys float up on our shorelines, as we know, <laughs> or get collected by people's houses. I have no idea why that's art, but... <laughs> uh, so, um, but yes, so uh, through the state of Florida, we can get you a permit to go ahead and do these. Um, you would not want to be in possession of any fishery product uh, if you're doing that, but absolutely, it's something we're trying to encourage. Um, it's a big bar. Um, the number one felony in this county, besides drunk driving, is, what do you think? Trap molesting, poaching. 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 Uh, yep, poaching by any other name. A single person going out. Now, commercial fishermen rob each other's traps because they can pull 300 in a night. That does real damage. A rec one recreational person robbing one trap, it's an annoyance to the commercial guys. It doesn't put them out of business. 60,000 coming down on opening day? <laughs> um, that's 15% of the traps in the fishery being robbed, if they only robbed one. Do you have a good count on how many people come down here? For uh, we think we do. So we sell licenses. Um, and we do two things. We actually send out a survey. Turns out, pretty much only people who are really excited about lobsters do our survey anymore. <laughs> um, how many of you have gotten spam email that says, oh, please answer our survey? Yeah, I don't even answer it anymore. Uh, but the other thing we do is we fly around in a plane and we count boats. Um, we usually use two planes, actually, because the number of boats peaks at 7 a.m. <laughs> um, uh, it's a peaks a little earlier on the bay. People go to the reef a little bit later. Um, now, what we don't have a good handle on is double tripping. Um, on a windy day, people probably only go out once. They get their limit, 
and they come back, almost everyone gets their limit. Um, uh, but during nice days, we are about to probably have one of the nicest, calmest lobster seasons we've ever had. It's going to be a lot of people, <laughs> and they're going to be out there for a long time. Um, the opera, you're going to have calm weather, come back in at lunch, go back out. Um, so that is something we're quite worried about, um, the double tripping. It is very hard to catch um, unless someone actually says, I know there's 10 bag limits in their freezer, but then even then, you know, I don't think I want to give you all ideas on tape of how to avoid the law, so I'm going to cut that off. <laughs> um, they are hard cases to make. Um, back to lobster distribution. Um, lobsters are throughout the Caribbean. Um, these little stars are the main population areas. The Grand Bahama Bank is responsible for about 25% of the landings. Um, the Isle of Youth down there in Cuba, that whole area is a huge shallow area. Just look at the size of these areas are the main lobsters compared to Florida. <laughs> um, there's a lot more water down there. Um, Cuba is about 19%. That Honduras, Nicaragua area is probably about between them another 35%. Uh, both those countries have a lot of lobsters. Um, Florida is responsible for about 7% of landings, Dominican Republic about 7%, even though most people think the Dominicans go to the Hamian waters <laughs> and fish illegally. Um, that's a huge issue. Um, a funny little star down here off of Brazil. Um, 10 years ago, if I gave you this lecture, all of these numbers would have been different, and I would have said Brazil's responsible for 25% of the landings. I'm going to show you a picture at the end. We've actually just called that a different species. Turns out the Amazon and Orinoco rivers, Amazon, of course, in Brazil, Orinoco and Venezuela, are such big rivers, they separate the ocean into parts. And it's so big that for the last million years, the lobsters have been separated genetically. Um, it's called Mary Purpuratus, which means purple wine. Um, it's a really pretty lobster. I've seen one in the Florida Keys, <laughs> and I've got a picture of it. Um, so that's the distribution of lobsters. This is the biggest lobster fishery in the world, except for the American lobster that is in America, and, I'm sorry, the United States and Canada. I have to watch when I say America because this is America too, <laughs> just Central America. And they get very testy when you refer to the United States as America, um, for good reason. Um, uh, there are 32 species of spiny lobster anywhere except for North America and a little tiny piece of Europe um, if you say you want a lobster dinner, you're going to get a spiny lobster. Um, all of Africa, all of Australia, it is all different species of spiny lobster. Um, but ours, in these 32 countries, is by far the biggest fishery. We have the cheapest lobster in the world. It's crappy. <laughs> it's a tropical lobster. Um, it grows very fast. It is hard to process regularly. When you cook it, overcook it, it turns into rubber. So it is very hard to cook um, when it's very large. By the time you've cooked the outside, uh, I'm sorry, by the time you've cooked the inside, the outside is overcooked and inedible. So it is a dang hard lobster to work with. Um, but there are certain, uh, if it's handled correctly, basically landed live and immediately whole cooked is what the, one of the primary products is for the world market. Um, if you freeze it first and then cook it, it's actually lost its moisture content and that's why it's the cheapest lobster in the world. In the 1960s, we lowered the size limit of the lobsters from one pound to a three inch shell. That's about a three quarter pound lobster. We did that very much on purpose because that lobster could be put on a plate at Red Lobsters or other family restaurants for under $20 and we could deliver a lobster dinner to the masses um, uh, in that market. Well, that was 1960. <laughs> The current market for spiny lobsters is live product in China. Everybody has a little, yeah, you might hate China, but they doubled the value of our fishery. So I'm not so mad about China as far as lobster fishing goes. Um, they will buy a lobster from us for $20, but they really want an 800 gram lobster. That three quarter pound, uh, one pound is 450 grams. Um, so that market is flooded. If that lobster that's 450 grams can actually grow in the wild, it'll molt twice, four months later, and can be 800 grams. And now it's valued at $30 a pound. So it nearly doubled in weight, it tripled in price. So that lobster 
that will, that we catch in August and sell for eight dollars or less could be sold for sixty dollars to the Chinese live market just four months later. That's the biggest thing I am trying to do to increase value per piece for the spiny lobster fishery. And it, of course, would triple the value. Some are going to die uh, as you go through their life. But that's the biggest thing I'm trying to do right now. The fishermen could do that, or we could bring them in and possibly aquaculture them. They call that grow out, simply putting them into situations. We could take a million of those lobsters, keep them for four months, sell them for peak market. The other cool thing about aquaculture is you wait till the price peaks <laughs> and you can sell whatever day you want. Um, so that's really the value of aquaculture. Life history. Eggs. A lot of that's going on right now. Spring's a little bit more common. This is not size appropriate. Lauren, do you have a pocket full of stuff? I do. I have some pythosomes <laughs> and I'll pass them around. And if you look at them, you can actually see there's little eyeballs. So those were just born out of an egg when they were preserved in that water. I'm guessing there's four or 500 <laughs> in there. Um, this, bat, this is actually about a three pound lobster. She's probably got about a million and a half eggs. That typical three quarter pound lobster that you see in the Florida Keys has about 300,000. That's a one and a half year old lobster. We think reproduction uh, maturity is based on age, not size. Mm -hmm. Turns out at about 22 months, and I'll tell you how we know 22 months is a lobster's birthday, uh, is uh, uh, so that's those first 300,000. The first year, she makes just one clutch of eggs. The second year, <clears throat> she actually usually has three clutches of eggs. It's a mature mother. She knows what she's doing. She starts reproducing in April, May, and June, and she's sort of done. Um, it's not quite an exponential curve, but through the course of her life, if she lived 20 years, she'd have 200 million babies. How many do you think survive? One third. <laughs> For a stable population of people, how many babies should each of us have? One, but boys don't get to have babies, so the girls get two. Same for them. So for a stable population, exactly the same math. <coughs> Each female should only have two babies survive. What happens to those other 200 million minus two? <laughs> food. Ecosystem for the food. They are not wasted. They are not lost. They are a primary food for everything else in the environment. Uh, cool stage, the uh, porioli. It's crystal clear. I'll show you a better picture of a minute. This guy's only job is to go from the open ocean to the near shore habitat. Why is it clear? It spends about two weeks in this life stage. Predation. Avoid predation. This guy has to swim over the reef at night. He's an okay swimmer. He's not a great swimmer. He's riding those incoming currents. Things like yellowtail snapper, are devouring these things. Um, then it settles into this perfect little lobster. This thing turns into that in about 10 days. It manufactures its own pigment. Um, and now I'm talking about chemicals. If you remember, I brought about everything in this animal's life is chemistry. All of these little hairs are picking up mechanoreceptors, picking up the current, picking up water chemistry, um, both from like a dead animal and its own interspecies communication. It goes from this algae phased animal. This is a Lorencia, a toxic red algae. It's living in this toxic red algae because less animals forage here. It doesn't bother it. And then it becomes a adult lobster, makes eggs, and moves on with its life cycle. So that's the basic life cycle. We'll zoom into that a little bit. Female lobsters, how to tell girls apart. Um, our lobsters have a claw. I know I have a girl here, I hope. Yeah. Huh. So, trick question. This is about a four and a half pounder. Um, I think it was about five years old. A pound, it gets to a pound in the first 18 months and then it gains a pound after that. This thing molts three times a year. It sheds its exoskeleton. This is a molt um, and we get them in the lab thing. So, trick question. Alive or dead? Neither. Or it still is alive because it's back in my laboratory. This is just like your nail clippings. Uh, so yeah, um, you, clearly not a live thing in my hand, but the lobster is totally alive walking around in my laboratory. Um, yeah, so this is a female. 
And of course, the leg has broken. <laughs> so she has a claw. That claw is to tear open the spermatophore. Fancy name for sperm in a package. Um, the male put that there. Um, she will use that claw to tear it open when she releases her eggs. Um, by Ramus. The pleopods have the feather and this internal stuff. When I show you the male, it is simply lacking that. It has those only to hold the eggs. Um, so the genital opening, you can sort of imagine, it's that tiny little thing right there. I'll show you a picture of a male. Honestly, when I sex a lobster, I don't look for that. Um, I just look for the male genital or the lack of it. So those are the basic characteristics. Um, a cool thing about uh, male lobsters, and I'll hold that one up in a minute, is the shell grows disproportionately larger. It's a secondary sexual characteristic like a lion's mane. The male's shell grows larger. He does that because he wants to impress the girls. Um, and we'll get into that in the reproductive side. So again, a couple. Uh, this one, there's that new black shiny one. It actually comes out as white. When you've cleaned the lobster, have you noticed the white material inside of it? That's the testes. It's like a white paste. Um, after an hour, it, it starts looking pink. And after a day, it turns black. And after a handful of days, it becomes this gray master used to sing. Here's a new one on top of an old one. This lobster is about to have eggs again. So that's one of the ways we know besides tagging lobsters uh, that they have multiple eggs. Um, so the cool things here, the little genital openings are these tiny little holes there. Um, this is a segmented animal. A worm you can think of as having an earthworm, all those segments. Each segment has a different pair of appendages. The antennas, the antennules, the legs, the mouth parts here, there's actually 10 mouth parts, and each of them has a different thing, uh, a cusp, a manual arundel here, the more legs, and then, of course, each tail segment has these. So this is a segmented animal, um, and it has all those features. Um, boys, caught off North Carolina. Um, that's nearly the biggest lobster that I've ever seen. I'd say that's about a 15-pounder. He's a typical fisherman, sort of shoving it as good game catchers know how to make it look bigger. Um, this one was in Florida. Um, and now we've got our typical male here. A little hard to see on that one. Uh, same age lobster. Tail's actually very close to the same size, but we can see the shell much larger. Males do the karate kid dance in front of girls. They stand high on their toes. Basically, they're trying to look bigger. Bigger lobsters get more girls. Males defend territories. The girls could care less. But because it's a nice place on the reef, they hang out. So the males are just there fighting each other during the reproductive season. And they do a little dance in front of the girls. And uh, that makes sense. You can see underneath the male genitals are much more prominent. So that's very easy to see. When they're mature, they're quite a bit bigger. Notice the tail, only the feather, not the other thing underneath it. And on the tip of the claw, no claw, just the dactyls. Other things, look how fuzzy these things are. Um, this is how a lobster knows it eats. Lobsters live on the coral reef. That's cover during the day. As soon as night falls, they leave. Um, when we were doing our casita research, there'd be 100 lobsters underneath the table the size of where Stacy's sitting right there. And there might be 100 lobsters under it. There would be 100 snails on top of it. That's perfect lobster food, but they don't eat there. They are hardwired to leave where they're at. When a lobster walks on the reef, it steps on living coral, and it's walking in soup, basically. It can't tell the difference between a snail and the living coral. It has to leave the coral, walk in sand or seagrass, to then actually find that little crab or little snail it wants to eat. These guys are munchers. They walk around picking up very small things, putting it in this mouth part, and anything they can put in their mouth, they can crush. Stone crabs use a large claw, can crush things. Lobsters use their mouth parts. Uh, yeah, I lost a leg. Uh, so this is a little female lobster. We tagged them as part of a growth study. I know it's a molt because the eyes are clear. If the eyes are cloudy, that means that's the eye. It's a dead animal. Um, when they molt, everything is lost on the outside. This is insane. Crack this thing open. 
There's the gills. Okay, I'm looking for the stomach. I, so the stomach, I was going to show you the stomach. For some reason, I can't see it. <laughs> uh, the stomach comes out backwards. They have to stop eating three or four days before they molt. If there was something in their stomach, it would be like an anchor, and they couldn't pull it out. So the molting process isn't just this. They stop eating, they go find shelter, and then uh, three days to clear the stomach, um, and about three days to harden up afterwards. So that molting is a, a week-long process. That's when it's tough to be a lobster. One of my funnier stories, diving in the western uh, Sambos, um, as a protected area off of Boca Chica Naval Air Station. Um, turns out things sort of know they're not being hunted there. We jump in the water, the red grouper swim up to you like a good hunting dog. <laughs> they're just hanging out with you. They know they're not going to be shot, very different behavior. They very quickly realize when me and my crew are there and we're looking for lobsters, and like a hunting dog, they swim ahead and point to them. <laughs> the reason they're doing this, and then they bump the antennas. They're testing to see if it's a soft lobster. They can't eat a hard lobster, but they can eat the crap out of a soft lobster. Um, and they know, after watching us catch a couple lobsters, we're a good hunting buddy. Um, a similar thing happened in the dry tortugas. Uh, uh, we'd work for the day counting lobsters, counting fish, doing the things we do out there. And then we'd park the boat at night and usually like swim just for fun at night because we already spent six hours in the water. Why wouldn't you want to spend another two hours just swimming around for fun? And one of the times I was there, um, we had 100 plus foot visibility. There were about a dozen black groupers, about 50 feet apart in a horizontal line, swimming like this. <laughs> they were pack hunting. Amberjack were above them, watching them. They found a critter. They actually knocked over a coral head to try to get it out. Turns out when that little shiny fish swam up, the amberjack got it. But that's what fish do. They hunt in packs like that. So for that red grouper to sort of hop in my pack was probably not an unusual behavior at all. It probably did it with sea turtles all the time and a lot of other stuff like that. It is so cool to be in marine protected areas and get to start to understand the behavior and stuff like that um, is really fun research. Phylosomes. So this is the little tiny one in Lauren's pocket. It's about 1.6 millimeters. That is about 120, eh, 120th of an inch. Six months later, it grows into this thing. That's an inch. If you were a tiny larval fish in the water, this would be the thing your nightmares were made of. These are spears. It floats down onto little fish larvae in the ocean and spears them with its leg. And basically, it would spear two or three because even little fish school. It then floats around. The fish might drag it around and eat, sort of eats it like a corn dog on a stick. Um, a very wicked animal. Um, six months in the ocean. That's nuts. <laughs> baby conch, baby fish spawning in our western dry rocks and stuff like that all take about 30 days. 30 days is a fine amount of time to be in the water column. You can be transported by currents a reasonable distance. Six months. Why in the world would an animal spend six months in the water column? That would allow it, if I threw a ping pong ball off of the reef here, six months later, that ping pong ball would be in frickin' England. <laughs> Why would a lobster do that? Um, they are the true generalists, those 200 million babies. They don't care where they go. They just know they're going to go somewhere. Most of them probably don't go anywhere. We did a genetic study a few years ago that I barely believe. Every month we go out, we have collectors, and we catch those little phylosomes. This next stage, that crystal clear animal is totally transparent except for its eyes. This animal doesn't even have a stomach. It's just feeding off its fat. What color is fat? It's cloudy and white. There's no cloudy white. It has actually converted the fat to a to a clear condition that it can barely use. <laughs> um, so everything is about survival of this animal. We go out every month and catch these. Turns out there's a very nice relationship between the number of these that come in and the harvest a year and a half later. Took us, uh, I'm not going to say us anymore. I didn't figure it out for 30 years. I hired somebody and they figured it out just by doing brute math <laughs> on all the animals we'd collected. Um, 
uh, Emily Hutchinson was tenacious in analyzing this data. Um, and these animals come in and uh, here's that handful of ones. You can see some clear ones. You can see some with pigment. Um, all of these animals are within about 10 days of the same age. And this is typically what we would harvest in the winter. During the summer, we get quite a few less. Um, they're coming shoreward. And I've totally forgotten the point I was going to make about this. <coughs> um, uh, but the number of babies matters. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the genetics. Um, so we went out and we caught adult lobsters in 32 different countries. Uh, every month of the year, we did the genetics here. We actually found out that one month, 30% of the baby lobsters that came into the Florida the Keys were siblings. They were born six months later someplace else. They stayed in a body of water, a gyre or something like that, and were transported here to the Florida Keys, not as a family unit, but brothers and sisters came here. That's nuts. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that every babe, mother has two babies that survive. It means that there's a couple mothers out there that are literally super mothers that are responsible. They were in the right place at the right time delivering lots of babies. I mentioned we went to 32 different places. I meant, I said countries, I should have said places. For example, we went to the Dry Tortugas, the Florida Keys, Panama City, Florida, Indian River. We found siblings in all those locations over the course of four years. So there was a super mother somewhere in the Caribbean that over a four year period had babies show up in all these other areas. They also showed up in the Dominican Republic. Water from the Florida Keys doesn't go to the Dominican Republic in one generation. Turns out little stuff in the Florida Keys sort of has three options and all depends on the wind and the weather. It can go to Southeast Florida. It can go in the Gulf Stream, the Florida Current and be lost to the Atlantic or every once in a while it chunks to the Bahamas. We highly suspect little baby lobsters from here do show up in the Bahamas and Bahamian lobsters can go back into the Caribbean to Cuba and the Dominican Republic. We sort of know within three generations, grandparents, parents, and children, that the entire population of lobsters is well mixed. There is no genetic difference between a lobster in Venezuela and here, except for that Mary Perperatus thing. Um, that's why lobsters live six months. They're highly adapted to dispersing in this broad, shallow sea. Um, I did that research twice. I still really don't believe it. <laughs> so I'm um, looking forward to someone else doing some of that work. Algae phase. You've seen this picture before. Um, this is Lorencia, that toxic red algae. Lobsters live in this for uh, um, about um, uh, maybe 90 days during the summer, a little longer in the winter. Um, and then they transition to sponges. Sponges. I love sponges. Nature apparently doesn't anymore. We have regular toxic harmful algae blooms, be it red tide, be it that cyanobacteria, that blue soup green water. That doesn't kill the sponges, but there's so much, there's a million cells in a liter of water and at night those cells use oxygen. So the oxygen crashes in Florida Bay when this algae is here and the sponges actually suffocate because there's no oxygen. They're a living animal that needs oxygen. Um, we have lost a huge number of the sponges. We're trying really hard to plant them out. Um, we've had hurricanes, literally the water got washed out and they dried out. Who knew a sponge could dry out? Um, but that happened after Irma. And we have lost every nursery we've planted. Um, so we are having a really hard time bringing sponges back. Harmful algae blooms are something that happen every year now in a different portion of the bay. We're having a really hard time maintaining our environment um, until we sort of clean up some of the nutrient issues and stuff coming down from both the Keys and uh, agriculture upstream. This is what hard bottom is supposed to look like. A big loggerhead sponge that then many of you are typical seeing, uh, base sponges, a little tiny coral here, some hard hat sponges, uh, some other commercial ones, uh, this shaving brush, different species. Um, this is where little lobsters want to live. If you swam in this and you brushed away this little veneer of sediment, you would find hundreds and hundreds of little tiny snails. That's lobster food. They walk on this, they find it. Those little lobsters only have to walk a few inches. This is what Florida Bay is supposed to look like. This is a 30 year old picture. What Lauren was just talking about, she's revisiting these sites. They suck now. <laughs> um, between the heat killing this stuff, the hurricanes, the sedimentation, 
Um, this is an environment that is really, really in trouble. This is a noisy environment. Have any of y'all like ever thought underwater was noisy? Yes, always. What are you thinking about? Besides boats running over you? Thinking about the noise? Yeah. Fish eating, it's sometimes it's definitely Just the yes. background yeah. noise. Yeah. It's a thing called a snapping shrimp. It literally has one claw that snaps. It snaps so loud it sends a concussion wave and that's what kills little fish and then eats them. It's just constant tinnitus going on in your ears. That noise is how larval fish find where to settle. If there's water, they're moving with the currents. So they're not picking up water chemistry and stuff. Now, most of these do have a magnetic signal to say they're moving in the right direction or a direction. Um, but it's really sound. Sounds crazy. Whale sounds. You can think of all these organisms that make sound. Little larval fish pick up that sound and say, there's something good up there. And that's where they ride the currents to that area. And so this is incredibly important juvenile fish habitat. We've lost most of it in the Florida Keys. Um, there's a little lobster. It's called disruptive coloration. It's got that white line down its body, very hard to see. His job is to hide. <laughs> All he wants to do is hide and get bigger. Um, everything will eat a lobster that big. We think probably 999 out of 1,000 at that stage get eaten. Um, again, they're not lost. They're just food for everything else in the ecosystem. And then they find that sponge. And this is why sponges are important to little lobsters. It's that nursery habitat that they live under. Um, another video, um, this one is um, an octopus, as I've mentioned. Um, uh, octopus love traps. They actually use them as dens, and that's where their eggs are. Um, um, they apparently don't, but they also eat lobsters. So there's our octopus peeking up from underneath the trap <laughs> and striking out to catch the lobsters. Really sick that you think this is funny. <laughs> it catches it. They have a toxic bite. And that lobster is totally paralyzed and disabled. Are some people call that a squirrel fish, a dipectra? Uh, yeah, did they help each other? Probably not. <laughs> um, um, yeah. And he did escape. Um, really, the octopus usually only kills one when it's feeding. Um, it will kill all of them if it's a female octopus and it's oh, going to make its nest right there. Ball, yeah. Female octopus don't feed. They're just defending yeah. their den, and they'll have a cluster of eggs there. Um, pulling the trap again. Uh, uh, and so that's what we call Now, lobsters, I'm sorry, octopus can probably eat lobsters all they want. They're a very efficient predator. But certainly in a restricted area like that, that's that term again, depredation. About half the lobsters that were preyed upon in our study were due to octopus. Um, adult lobsters. This picture was sent to me from uh, off of Palm Beach. There were hundreds of lobsters walking in a group in a line. They call that queuing. Turns out when lobsters move from one area to another, they do that for a couple of reasons. Every night, they might do it to forage. They do that in small groups of five or 10. But in front of a hurricane or a cold front, they've picked up the low pressure signal. Doesn't matter to them if it's a hurricane or a cold front. Shallow water is going to be a bad place to be. So they pick up that low pressure. That gives them two or three days to move to deep water. That's the main reason lobsters walk in this queuing behavior. Has anybody seen that down here? Yeah, why is that? Because we catch five million lobsters in August. <laughs> there simply aren't enough lobsters to do this behavior anymore. Um, almost all of the fishermen have seen this behavior before. It still occurs in places like the Bahamas. Uh, uh, does anybody recognize this place, finishing off the life history? Biggest reef in the Florida Keys? Lou. This is Lou Key. Um, Lou Key has been a protected area since 1986. Um, we thought it was really cool. We learned a lot about lobster behavior in this relatively small area the size of a lobster. Lobsters spend their day on the spur and groove in this area. At night, they go back to this rubble ridge. There's snails, crabs, chitons, all sorts of little tiny foods the lobster can step on, put into its mouth every night. Um, if they didn't get enough meal, sometimes they go to these little back reef 
things. And these are also the molt dens. Lobsters avoid the reef when they're molting, so they go to secluded areas where there's fewer fish. Um, and that's a typical lobster in a den. So we studied this area. We're very proud of ourselves. We had lobsters living here. They'd walk half a kilometer back to this rubble ridge area. They'd walk back. Males would set up territories during the summer. We did movement studies. We thought we knew what lobsters did. And we were very happy with our work. And then off of Boca Chica, I mentioned the Western Sambos was created. I'm into an hour, sorry. <laughs> and it um, uh, turns out that area was 10 kilometers long, and lo and behold, lobsters walked 10 kilometers in it. Our study, the lobsters we were studying, are still the ones that simply weren't caught. The lobsters whose behavior was to stay a little closer to home is our entire study was basically totally based on the size of our study area. We got a little study area that was 10 times bigger, and lo and behold, lobsters walked 10 times further. We think we're really good sometimes. <laughs> and then, oh well, nature sort of teaches us. I apologize that this is so bad. This was taken from a video. This is about 2,000 lobsters. This was off Jacksonville, a walk back in about 1995. The diver went in, swam down, was very confused. He was looking for his ledge to shoot his fish. He couldn't see it. Then he realized the bottom was sort of moving. This probably went on for about half a mile. There were probably 100,000 lobsters in this walk. Uh, these are two to four pound lobsters, nice three and five year old animals. Um, uh, I need to get the video converted to tape so you can sort of see this instead of this old screen grab from it. Um, this is that same shot of lobsters I showed a minute ago. They were walking in a small queue. Um, and this was, of course, off Palm Beach, I mentioned. Um, lobster movement. The little larvae come in, settle in this little lobster factory here. Basically, early in the season, lobsters move this way, but then later in the season, October, the hurricane season, those cold fronts come, and they take a shorter walk to the reef. Basically, lobsters might walk left, they might walk right. We have no idea. It seems to be about 50-50, but that's sort of lobster movement. This is the content keys area. Turns out these lobsters are all juveniles, but they're in the two-pound range. Same growth rate as in the dry tortugas. We think these are the same lobsters that are here. Um, they just grow really fast. Um, uh, growth of lobsters in age is a big part of our research. Here's the third, we're getting to the end here, sort of the same camera stuff, and this is escapes. Um, we mentioned part of what we wanted to understand was lobster predation. Um, the other thing we want to know is lobster escape. And here's the things that happens to lobsters. Um, after about six weeks, uh, maybe even four weeks, lobsters quit trying to escape. Um, uh, and so this is our research here. And this lobster is about to prove me wrong. That red tag is a six-week starved lobster. Well, he got out so much for our theory. But turns out when you do the math, it is very rare for the six-week starved animals to get out. Um, no tag, that was a freshly caught lobster getting out. Um, here's a shot at night. Um, a lobster trying to enter the trap, turns out they enter backwards. They first look in, then they turn their tail, just like when they back into a hole. And I'm not sure if he's helping, but he certainly got out. Um, so this was about 10,000 hours of video to catch those escapes. Even though it looks like it happens a lot in these videos, it is a rare event. Um, a lobster gets out 1.8% of the time. So let's just convert that to 2%. That means it takes 50 days for the average lobster to get out. Um, and we think a lobster starts starving at about four to six weeks. So basically six times seven, 42. So lobsters basically um, are much more likely to starve in a trap than escape due to that. Um, um, cable ties. So um, uh, and it loses the tag. So the tags we're using here are simply on a cable tie on the antenna. Um, when we do true growth studies, um, we used to actually take, um, they call it a T-bar anchor tag. It looks like a piece of spaghetti and it really is just a piece of plastic T and that sticks in. It's not a great way to tag lobsters. Um, uh, they lose it. We've misestimated growth for many years. The cool thing we do, um, and this was technology developed for the salmon fishery in the Pacific. It's a microwire tag. It actually has little notches in it that with the right scanner, you see those notches and can convert it. We can put that tag in a 0.2 gram lobster. 
and it keeps it because it's internal. We're hoping it's small enough where no one ever chokes on it. <laughs> um, but uh, um, that technology has really allowed us to understand the growth. Um, nobody can see it, so we don't get many returns. We have to do our own research in closed areas, and hopefully we catch them. And basically, we use a metal scanner like they do in the airport. It can pick up that little piece of metal, and that's how we scan them. So uh, it's, it's really cool technology we're starting to use now. Um, are you all familiar with the term blue comedy? <laughs> so what am I, do y'all want to hear blue comedy? <laughs> um, lobster sex. Um, male lobsters are kind and gentle lovers. Um, this is the male on the bottom. So um, I'm not sure I'm going to, since this is being filmed, I'm not going to do the actual display. So a male lobster walks in front of the female lobster, raises up on its feet, tries to look nice and big. If the female likes her, her response is to pee in his face. Lobster biology. That's where the urine comes out. Why in the world do lobsters pee on their own faces? They don't. Water flow comes in this way and out this way. So actually, all the urine does actually go away from their gills and they're active. The water's not coming in here where we breathe and things. The water's coming in here. So to put the Euro openings here, the water is going away. Dogs. Dogs greet, what's the first thing they do? Smell each other's butts. There's little glands out there. They're picking up a lot of information about what that other dog is going on. Are they in heat? Are the other things? So the male lobster comes in, uses its antenna to corral the female. She pees in his face, tells him, I have ripe ovaries. I'm ready to be mated with. He's not done yet. He's a gentleman. These males have body dimorphism. Notice how long the second pair of legs is. It is long enough to reach under and touch here. What's going on on a female lobster right here? That's spermatophore. If she's already been mated with, he reaches down, touches that. Oh, sorry, you're taken. <laughs> if he touches the spermatophore, he knows she's already been mated with, and he walks away and doesn't waste his time anymore. So the male stands up. She signals by peeing in his face. He grasps her with these legs, rolls over. About three seconds later, these inflate, act like suction cups, and that spermatophore is transferred. So the actual process is very fast. Um, he's careful. He can measure how much sperm he puts on her belly. Smaller lobsters make less eggs, use less sperm. A large female, he might put a larger one there. Turns out he can mate 13 times in a night. There's another researcher named Mark Butler who did that experiment. I think he has a little bit of an issue, um, <laughs> but um, it was interesting research. So one male can actually service an awful lot of females in one night. Um, so there is no concept of the thing of sperm limitation or thing like that. That's an actual thing biologists talk about at parties. So if, if there's a gentleman, why did the picture that you showed earlier have two spermatophores? Um, so she was mated with a month earlier, had eggs, and the next spermatophore was for the next batch of eggs. So underneath that one, it had been used. It had been largely scraped away, and there were just remnants left. So it's sequential. Um, other critters, last two slides. Um, we just had a, so there are four families of spiny lobsters. The most ancient one is called the Astacidae. There will not be a quiz on that word. Spinies and then our clawed lobsters. This is a real cool little lobster that lives only at the reef here. Panularis cutatus, some of the spotted or the starry lobster. Um, uh, people don't see it very often. If you tickle it with your stick, it actually backs up into the reef. It is very hard to catch. It rarely gets over a pound. This is the green lobster, Panularis levicauda. It is typically in the southern Caribbean, mostly around Brazil. Um, uh, five times in the last 50 years, we've had tens of thousands of these show up in the Florida Keys. They only come from Brazil and Venezuela. So that's sort of a signal of how quickly these can get here and how infrequently. And this is that new lobster in Brazil, Mary Purpuratus, the purple. The legs are distinctly purple. And the tail really is lacking the eye spots. Our typical lobster here has very pronounced eye spots in each segment. 
uh, very diminished, almost dots and dashes here. Um, I've only ever seen one of these species. I've seen a few in the Virgin Islands. And the further south you go, you see a few more. So spinies, the astacidae, the hairy lobster, slipper lobsters, or bulldozers. Um, the red dot, this is the one we have commonly back here in the bay. It gets up to about two pounds. It's usually much smaller than that. Equinoctialis, purple dots. It's much more common on the reef. Um, and this is a worldwide distribution called Antarcticus. When we find animals, it's usually named for where it's first found. So this animal was actually found off the coast of Chile. This species is distributed worldwide. In that study we did in Luki, we had one of these that was in the same hole for four years. It basically never went anywhere. Um, and that's basically all I know about that species. That <coughs> one was in a hole for four years. <coughs> I got a big book on my desk. A big thing I do is law enforcement and court cases. I get pictures sent to me from officers all over Florida when they have an imported pile of boxes. <clears throat> they get very excited. A legal lobster tail here weighs about five ounces. They'll have a box of tails that's three ounces. They think they've got 100,000, the case of their life. I said, send me a picture. <laughs> and I go through my little book and find out, no, that one's from Indonesia, and that's as big as it gets, and it's a totally legal product. And they get very upset. <laughs> um, I mentioned there's 32 species of these. Um, that's ours, Panularis argus. This is our spotted lobster, Panularis catatus. And I really can't name the rest of them off the top of my head anymore. I, you know, I used to be able to recognize these. Now I have to get the book out. Um, that wraps it up. Casey Butler is the one who made all these videos and released them. That's one of her pictures there. Uh, so I've got a whole group of people who are, frankly, a whole lot smarter than I am. We're doing the same research we've done for 30 years, but the people I have now are doing it a whole lot better than we used to do. So thank you for your time. <laughs> and any questions? Or talk, I mean, I, I was on a night dive once, and the slipper was in a uh, was walking along, and a spiny was down in this kind of hole, and it was like going towards. I was going to fall down the hole. Where they get? They're going to fight, and I just got there because <laughs> I want to watch them fight. And nothing. They just kind of like touched each other, and then they went on. Um, Do you have any? They any we think them? they are basically neutral to each okay. other. Um, if you swim hunting for spiny lobsters, you see the large antennas. We all sort of know how to do that. Um, we have basically no regulations on these except for don't take egg bearing. They are very common. They're just upside down in the same holes. <laughs> Who stucks on their back and looks upside down? So they basically, we think they're neutral to each other. A little bit different for that spotted lobster. Um, uh, it's mean. <laughs> it's a mean little lobster. Um, and it will chase other Argus out of its den. Um, it is much more den specific. We think it basically lives in the same den most of its life. Um, males, again, set up harems. At the front of the den, there's almost always a large male. Hidden back in the cracks and crevices is many smaller females. Um, but um, so, yeah, our two species, the spinies, don't get along, but we think the slipper lobsters are totally neutral. We can eat the crap out of them, they're delicious. <laughs> yes, um, because they don't move. Their meat is much more flaky and white. Okay. So they are actually a much better seafood product than Panularis argus, our spiny lobster. But there's not a real catching. Only because you don't look upside down. <laughs> uh, no. What don't they go in the traps? Um, they do rarely. Um, but the, uh, the notifer, sorry, let me get to this one. This one is a little bit more in the bay and wanders around a little bit more. And they certainly go in traps. Each fisherman will catch one or two of these when they're pulling 300 traps. This one is much more reef specific, and it really doesn't leave the reef. And fishermen honestly try not to drop their traps on the reef. Not to protect corals, but the, tree, the reef damages their trap and would tangle in the ropes and things. So um, happenstance, no, they don't fish on the reef. Um, and that's where you would catch that species. With the more fishing pressure on, on spiny lobster, have the other species kind of taken over the ecological niches, or are they still separate? Um, I would say we know absolutely nothing about the population of slipper lobsters. Um, I'm being like confident, oh, just look upside down. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, they hide really well. Um, I've got a couple of cool stories. Um, Xerxes is that giant base sponge. 
I was out diving one time at Delta um, when those sponges were much more abundant and they reproduced. Went from 30, 40 foot visibility on a bright sunny day to five foot visibility. There were so many gametes in the water. Slipper lobsters, a dozen of them just crawled out of the reef and started chasing each other and doing what apparently slipper lobsters do during the middle of the day because the light level dropped to almost nothing. That's like my only slipper lobster story. <laughs> um, we just don't know much about them. So. Question. So yeah. in some fisheries, there's actually a moratorium of how many species you can actually take. And I know we talked about the commercial fisheries catch like four billion. We talked about many Susan and like a million and the next day half a million. So do you actually have an estimate of how many spawning lobsters are actually out there in the population? We try. Um, this is the whole basis of what we call stock assessment. Um, uh, What's the, number? <laughs> the harvest. Uh, um, uh, so one and a half million for the recreational, let's say as high as five and a half million for the commercial. So that's eight million. Um, so basically for legal sized lobsters, I'm very carefully not saying adults right. because most of the lobsters we catch are juveniles. Um, we catch that 80 or 90%. So there's probably only a million left out there walking around. So have you ever had to close the fisheries? Is there anything that causes you to close the lobsters? Um, so I spent last week in, Ven in uh, Nicaragua. We're closing the fishery. They have overfished. Um, and they are not being certified as a stable fishery, and they are having to do things to not catch as many lobsters. We are very fortunate in the Florida Keys that the babies here came from somewhere else every year. So we've been catching 90% of the lobsters. My paper actually says 86. I think oh. we're catching a few more now. Um, we've been doing this for 50 years. And you've never had a close No, so it's crazy, but it's sustainable. Now we're catching a lobster that's too small for the market. So there's other things we can do to increase value. We are 7% of this population throughout the Caribbean. If we're a tiny little fraction of the population on the downstream side of it, we can get away with doing almost whatever we want. And quite frankly, we do. Um, is it a good thing? No, not for our value, but I'm just, I'm talking value. I'm not talking ecology and stuff here. So um, yeah, we have our geography. And our fraction of the population has allowed us to do things that nobody else in the world could get away with in a fishery. Um, good or bad, it's what we do. <laughs> so, What's stopping us from having like a derby for ghost traps? What's the legal reasons behind that? Um, this is a tough one. Um, the commercial industry. Um, we mentioned, besides drunk driving is my joke, the biggest felony down here is trap molesting. The commercial fishermen are scared to death that people will sort of touch their traps. But during the closed season, yeah, we need to. There's 100,000 lost, and they needed to be opened up um, because they will continue to fish for a year. Um, how, how many people would you trust <laughs> to go into your house and, and take care of something that's broken and not take something else? Um, fishermen get carried away. I've got family that I can't go fishing with. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, uh, do people take more than the bag limit in fishing and things like that? Yeah. So to sit there and take traps, open them up, let the lobsters out, not take them, it's a big ask. Uh, do I think it's something we should do? Absolutely. So. <laughs> there have been efforts to increase that minimum size limit? Um, yes. Uh, they have not gone very far. Is there anybody in particular pushing back on it, the commercial or The commercial industry. Even though they'll catch more value for... Um, so that is a big part of my job. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. Um, they know they can do this well. Now, Florida Bay, that's where we catch the majority of those three quarter to one pound lobsters. If we increase the size a quarter of an inch so that the smallest weight animal we are catching is a pound, you couldn't fish in Florida Bay anymore. Those lobsters would reach maturity and move to the reef. So those 200,000 traps north of Marathon in the Bay wouldn't be viable anymore. Where would those traps go? The ocean side and the reef. Do we want 200,000 traps dumped near the reef where the winds are blowing and are gonna damage corals? Would it be unrealistic to have a split limit? Uh, so no, a slot limit is Not what they term- for a bay oh. side and ocean side? Um, very hard to enforce. Um, um, uh, basically, the entire Caribbean has a three-inch size limit, which converts 
in a shipped box to a five ounce tail. Officers can walk into any house in the world and say if it's pannular, it's Argus, and if there's a box of four ounce tails, it's illegal, they can seize it. And with tracing now, which we do for basically all seafood, we can track it back to the country of origin and find the person who handled it. Um, we call that the Lacey Act in the United States. It's a very powerful tool allowing us to enforce foreign fishery violations. Um, that whole story about lobsters and things, yeah, we could talk about other things. The summary is it would be very disruptive to the current fishery. It would be more value. Could they adjust and things like that? Maybe. But now it's a matter of balancing livelihood and stuff like that. So um, even though I come out and say, yeah, pretty much give me four months and I can double the value of this fishery, it would change how people do things. Um, and they would have to adjust. Could they adjust? Do storms come and things like that? Um, it's easy for me, a college kid, to say, oh, this will work just fine. But to put it into practice might be a little bit different. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom. We really appreciate it. <laughs> you said this was being recorded. I think. Yes, this will be up on the Reef website tomorrow. Um, Stacy will post it. It'll be on the Fish and Friends link. If you stop by afterwards, I can uh, give you the link to it. <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah great question yeah all of these fish and friends are recorded um you can find them on our website online and speaking of our fish and friends next one will be the second uh tuesday in august and it'll be stacy who's teaching us how to take a picture underwater um so stop by a uh, second tuesday in august that'll actually be our last one for the year um and then we'll move into our derby season refest season holiday party um, but for tonight, thank you so much, Tom, for coming. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. We'll see you all soon.